A reading from St. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, There will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. The backdrop to our readings from John's Gospel last week and this has been the impending Passover festival. Jerusalem is thronged with people, many of whom have travelled a long way to be there. Crowds gather in an instant, and there is mounting excitement and anticipation all around, with swirling gossip and rumour. Think Pompey before the cup final, but with a powerful element of religious fervour and a lot of politics all mixed in. In the verses just before today's passage, we hear how news came through that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, how crowds went out to greet him, palm tree branches in hand, and how the shouts of Hosanna rang all around, not unlike the cheering and clapping and saucepan banging of a Thursday night as the NHS and essential workers are honoured and thanked in these troubled times. John makes it clear how the disciples only understood the significance of what was happening when they look back after his glorification, a word John uses to incorporate all the events that we will be marking over the coming days and weeks. Jesus' willing surrender of his life, his crucifixion and resurrection, his return to the Father and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. John has a wonderful capacity for using one word to mean a very great deal. Way back in his Gospel, we heard Jesus say at the wedding feast in Cana that his hour had not yet come. When his teaching in the temple so infuriated the leaders, we are told they held back from arresting him because his hour had not yet come. But now his hour has come. And with it, an urgent message from some Greeks about how they want to see Jesus. The message is brought to Jesus by two disciples, Philip and Andrew, whose names also happen to be Greek in origin. Here, representing the rest of the world, 
the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, are seeking to see Jesus. So far, they have been just signs pointing to the gift that is to come. Now they and we are going to see the gift itself, and indeed be given the gift. But it has to begin with the agony of death for Jesus. There is no other way. No wonder his heart is troubled. It is very timely that we hear Jesus speaking of the grain of wheat at a time of the year when so many gardeners and farmers are planting seeds. I've got trays and pots on windowsills all over, not of wheat, of course, but the truth still holds. Each seed has a hard exterior in which the potential for life is contained. Only in the earth can that husk soften and rot and break open and allow the power of new life to emerge. Roots go downwards and shoots strive for the light and then grow taller and stronger and by harvest time bear many seeds where once there was just one. The pattern and the miracle of life. Jesus offers himself, his very life, to come alive in hundreds, then thousands, then millions of lives. But first he has to die. And we too, if we are going to share in that life and pass on that life, have to learn that same pattern. When Jesus says we have to hate our life in this world in order to find eternal life, we could so easily get the wrong end of the stick. Jesus isn't telling us to hate our lives, or indeed ourselves. But he is saying that if you stay within that hard husk, if you remain barricaded in as a single seed, clinging to a selfish, ego-based life, if you are afraid to let go, then you cannot live in Christ and he in you, and become part of that great pattern of new life. Life as St. John sees it in Christ is there to be given in order that it may be surrendered for a better eternal life, which is what being in Christ is. We are living through very troubling times, and while for some the struggle is about being confined to home and restricted in what we can do or who we can see, for others it means taking serious risk, going on to that ward for another shift to care for the very ill, turning up for work, among the very vulnerable in a care home, taking that essential delivery from A to B, or going on the beat to ensure people are keeping themselves and others safe in how they behave. Just a few examples from people on my telephone list of life in the current situation. For everyone, a background of anxiety and concern, even when the sun is shining, or when an element of light-heartedness helps us through the day. This week of all weeks, we who follow Christ are called to walk with him and to share in, reflect on and enter into all that that extraordinary and willing offering of his life on the cross set in train and to be for others what he calls us to be, children of light, children of his light, a light that shines in the darkness and can never be overwhelmed. May God bless you and keep you this day and always. Amen.